I'm going to talk about analytics for startup fundraising. Um, so why do I care about this? Like, why am I here to talk about it? Uh, there's a couple reasons. One is I myself uh, am a co-founder of a startup. Uh, so I'm a co-founder of Mode. Uh, at Mode, Mode's been around for five and a half years. Uh, this is us starting Mode five and a half years ago. Uh, so this was, whatever, August 20-something, 20 2013. Uh, in the time between when this picture was taken and today, we have raised several rounds of funding. Uh, so Mode has actually gone out and raised six rounds, depending on how you define a round. Uh, of funding, and so we've gone through this process a lot. We've seen things that work, we've seen things that don't work, uh, and wanted to be able to share some of those things with all of y'all about what we've seen from our own fundraising process. Uh, but on top of that, and on top of being a, a startup founder myself, uh, what Mode does is Mode is software for data analysts and data scientists. So folks at companies use it to be able to do analysis on the data that they have, uh, whether or not that's marketing data, sales data, product data, whatever that is. Uh, in a lot of cases, that's actually data for fundraising. Uh, if you're an earlier stage company and you're a Mode customer, a lot of times people are using it to put together decks for, for their presentations and to be able to do those things that you want to do to raise money. So when we're talking to our customers, uh, a lot of times we'll see them trying to do this. They'll have charts that look like this. Uh, and so we work through with them, in some cases, on these problems themselves. So our perspective is both from the, the data side as well as from the startup side. So, it's kind of why we're, we're here to share about it um, and, and share some of the perspectives that we have, again, from raising money ourselves, as well as the things that we've learned from a lot of our customers that have gone out and done the same thing. Um, so uh, who is this for? So fundraising is kind of a very broad thing. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can do it, a lot of different companies that are out trying to do it. Uh, I want to be explicit about what it is that, that we're talking about here, that, that who is this actually, actually for. So first of all, this is about what to pitch, not like when to pitch or who to pitch or how to decide and find investors. Um, there's lots of things on the internet for all of that. Uh, that's not what this is. This is about like what are the numbers that you need to have in your presentations when you're actually giving these pitches. The second thing is it's for earlier stage startups, not later stage or growth stage. Um, the fundraising process is very different the further you get out. Uh, once you're in like series C, D, and various letters beyond that, uh, the fundraising process is not at all what it is for a Series A or Series B company. Uh, for a recent example, Mode, we just raised our Series C. We actually raised it without ever speaking directly to the people who invested. We did it all over like email and Zoom. Uh, that's not something that would happen in, in a Series A fundraising typically. You typically have a, a much sort of deeper relationship you're trying to build with those folks, whereas later fundraisers are often much more about like here are the numbers. It's sort of a, a black and white decision whether or not somebody wants to invest. Uh, so this is, again, for the folks in the kind of seed to B round uh, fundraising, roughly. Uh, third is this is for VC fundraising, not friends and family rounds, not debt rounds, uh, not various other ways that you may gather money. Uh, if you're looking to raise money on like angel list, that may be a different process than, than the things here. It can be kind of similar, like people are, who are giving you money are probably all looking for roughly the same things. But VCs have a very sort of formulaic way of doing this. There's much more structure to the way they typically think about raising money and evaluating companies when they're, when they're putting money into those companies. Uh, friends and family might have a very different process. So if you're, you're out trying to get a check from, from uh, your rich uncle, this may not apply. Finally, uh, this is for the rest of us. This is not for the slacks and the birds of the world. Uh, if you have charts that look like this or charts that look like this, this is your fundraising pitch. Uh, if you're one of these things that's like absolutely taking off, send this out to, to a bunch of people, wait for a bunch of checks to come in, choose who you want to take. Uh, fundraising is really easy with charts like this. So say you don't have that. Say you are not in this position. Uh, the question then is like, okay, what, what actually goes into the deck? What goes into the pitch? Uh, and that's the, the meat of what I want to cover here is what actually is, is in these, these pitches. Uh, what are the things that you need to include? So there's a lot of different ways you can cut it. Uh, if you Google that, you'll see a bunch of different lists like this. Like Sequoia has a kind of famous one for like this is the, the structured way to raise money. Um, this is the way that I put it. So there's these kind of six things that I would broadly bucket into two categories. The first top category is just kind of the context of your company. These are some of like the softer things. These are the things about your team, your vision, uh, your market. It's all of the, the pieces around what it is that you're trying to do. And a lot of this is more sort of the narrative behind you, your company why it exists, why you think the world might need it. The, the second half of this, about the growth and traction of your company, about the stickiness of your product, about the acquisition economics for, for acquiring customers, this is something where investors really want to be able to see data. 
this is where you're actually trying to prove, hey, look, we have a viable product, we have a viable business, or at least the seeds of that, uh, and the more data you can tell in that story, the, the better your pitch will be. And so this is really what I want to talk about for the rest of the time, is, is the data that actually goes into telling these stories. Um, so that's the rest of this talk. Uh, it's the data that investors want to see to, to sort of fill out those, those final three pieces of your pitch. Um, it's how to actually get that data, so it's sort of easy to say, great, put these slides together, this is what you need. How do you actually go about getting that and, and sort of doing that in practice? And finally, what are some closing tips on pitching? So pitching isn't just about, here are some charts, there's a lot of other things that go into it as well. Uh, and so what are some closing tips about how do you kind of bring this all together? So uh, to get into that, uh, the first part I want to talk about is this growth and traction bit. Uh, so like I said, this is kind of the first, the first part of your sort of metrics driven story behind uh, how to raise money or like how to tell the story behind your company that investors want to see when you're raising money. Um, and so what is it really asking when people are asking this? Uh, they're asking like, are people finding your product? Investors are asking, are people willing to pay for it? Are people wanting to sign up? Is there something compelling that you have to offer that, that people want to come to and, and actually use? Uh, and so th all these metrics they're looking at are actually things designed to answer these questions from, from VCs. Um, so there's three kind of big metrics I would, I would point out that are important here. Uh, first one is signups, second one is daily active users, third one is monthly revenue. These all seem pretty straightforward, but they're often a little less straightforward than they seem. Uh, so we can go through each of them. Uh, so for signups, uh, simple question, how many people are signing up to use your product? Uh, if you don't have a, a product that people sign up for, it's how many people are coming to it every day uh, or like using it for the first time. Say you're like a content service, how many new people are finding your content for the first time? Uh, if you're a, a product where you're selling a good, um, how many people might be buying that product for the first time? So just basically how many new people are coming to your service every day? Uh, that's fairly straightforward. The one sort of point I would make about this is VCs aren't always like the most sophisticated when they're looking at numbers. They have kind of formulas they're looking for. Uh, but one place where they are sophisticated enough is don't use cumulative totals. Uh, it's really tempting to put a chart that looks like this in a deck where it's like, look, our cumulative totals are this like beautiful curve that's up into the right. It all looks great. Uh, this is something that investors will very much see through. Uh, and it's, it's a sign of, of a pitch is not being serious. It's a sign of you haven't actually really vetted this. You're trying to sort of pull something over somebody's eyes. Uh, you're not trying to tell a real story. You're trying to just show something that looks good. Uh, so as, as with any metrics, but particularly with something like this, don't use cumulative metrics. Use a chart that's like monthly totals of signups or something like that that shows how the trends are changing, not just like you can add a bunch of numbers to other numbers. Um, the second thing on here is daily active users, is sort of the next measure of, of product traction. Um, again, this is relatively simple. It's like how many people are using your product every day? So say you're, you're a SaaS application, how many people are logging into it every day? Uh, say you're a content service, how many people are, are coming and actually reading articles or, or whatever product you're providing? If you're selling goods, again, how many people are perhaps buying those goods? Uh, in this case, though, there's another kind of, another sort of tip to be, to be thinking about here is define what active is. It's pretty easy, actually, to, to just sort of have a definition here that you don't think that hard about. Uh, and then in a pitch, investors may ask you, like, hey, what does active actually mean? Is an active user on Uber somebody who opens the app? Is an active user on Uber somebody who calls a ride? Uh, you need to have an answer for that. It often doesn't matter that much what the answer actually is. Uh, the point is you need to be consistent about it, and you need to actually know what's behind that number. That, again, another sign of kind of an unserious pitch is you have a bunch of metrics like daily active users, and then as soon as they ask one question about what does this mean, you don't have a, have a good answer of like, it's this type of thing. So for instance, like say you're this news app and fidget finners are kind of catching on fire. If someone dismisses this notification, are they active? Um, and that's one of the things that the investors are sort of digging into this sort of thing. They'll want to better understand exactly the trends behind how people are using it. And so being able to answer precisely what you mean by an active user or a sign up or other things for that matter uh, is really important to be able to show that you've actually thought through these numbers uh, in, a, in a precise way. Um, so the final thing on here is if you're to the stage where you're making money, showing how much money you're making is really important. Uh, so how much you bring in each month is often the way that people want to look at it. Um, that's kind of the easiest way. A lot of the way that, that investors will evaluate things is over monthly growth. So make it easy for them. Just show how this is how much revenue we're bringing in each, each month. Um, a couple sort of tips about this. One, and if you can like take away kind of anything if you're an early stage company from this, it's keep track of your revenue early. 
it's a huge pain to do this. It sounds really simple. It seems like the, the question you could answer the easiest is like, how much money do we make every month? It's remarkably hard to actually answer that question. Uh, when you have only a few customers, when you can like do it manually in a spreadsheet and you know it's exactly right, do that. Uh, don't sort of say, oh, we'll get to that later once we're, we're down the road, once we have more people, once we have someone in finance, we'll figure it all out. Uh, then you'll have to go back and audit a bunch of ugly data in Salesforce or in people's spreadsheets or in your founders' heads. Uh, don't do that, write it down, keep a track. It makes it way easier down the road. The other thing about monthly revenue is to give you a little sense of a benchmark, uh, the way that a lot of VCs will evaluate it is roughly on this concept of a T2, D3 rule. What this means is that this is kind of the growth pattern that investors wanna see. So in your first year, your revenue triples, in your second year, your revenue triples, or second year, you triple again. Third, fourth, and fifth year, you double. So it's like triple twice, double three times. That's the T2, D3 bit. Um, this is like the pace that, that is like the sign of a good growing company that, that Silicon Valley investors will be interested in. Uh, you don't actually have to hit this. This isn't like there's plenty of ways to raise money without being on this path. Uh, but if you want kind of a benchmark for what it is that people have expectations about, this is, this is roughly in line with, uh, with what it is that people expect. So for instance, folks, uh, the, the Zoom S1, which was Zoom's IPO filing recently, they like roughly doubled uh, around revenue of, I don't know, it was like 150 million or something. Uh, that's further down in this funnel, and that's one of the reasons that was considered such an impressive S1, is that the revenue was still doubling further down the road than, than investors expect. They expect this sort of path is kind of, again, the baseline for a company that's, that's on the trajectory to an IPO, but not necessarily something that's like changing the world. <clears throat> You're all changing the world, I'm kidding. Um, okay, so uh, the next step, uh, product stickiness. So once you have those things, great. You're telling a good story about people coming in, they're finding their product, uh, they're wanting to use the product. The next question is, is the product sticky? And when investors are asking this question, uh, really what they wanna know is, do people really use your product? Are they really digging into it? Do they wanna keep using it? Is it? It's great if you have an appealing message of you can get people to sign up for your app in the app store, uh, but the question is, can you actually get people to stick around? Do they actually want to continue to use it? Are you providing a real value to, to your customers? Um, so to go back to, to some three metrics, these are, these are the three things that, that investors often really use to measure whether or not your product is sticky. Uh, retention, and then we started to get into some of these jargony things like DAU over MAU and quick ratios, uh, which I can run through also these. So uh, retention, how many people come back after they use it? It's pretty simple. Um, just a question of once people sign up, do people return? This isn't, there's a few different ways to think about retention, and so it's important actually to be, to be mindful of what kind of retention you're talking about. Uh, there's user retention, there's customer retention, there's revenue retention. All of these things are different. Uh, different investors will want to see different things, particularly depending on your product. Uh, so I can kind of quickly outline what each of those are, uh, just to clarify like these things. You'll hear retention, and it doesn't always mean exactly the same thing. So user retention is pretty straightforward. Say you have six people use your product one month, next month three of them come back. It's a 50% retention rate, like that's pretty, pretty clear. Um, customer retention, which also you'll hear referred to as logo retention. So sometimes investors will say like, what's your logo retention? It's the same thing as customer retention. Customer retention is how many customers come back after they use your product. So say you have three customers using your product in one month, two of them come back, you've got 67% customer retention. Uh, revenue retention is like slightly more complicated, but not that complicated. Uh, so say of those three customers, you've got one paying you 40 bucks, one's paying you 30, and another's paying you 30 for 100 bucks total. Say the next month, two of them come back, but the one that was paying you 40 is now paying you 60. The one that was paying you 30 is now paying you 50. You've actually got 110 bucks from the customers that were originally paying you 100. Even though that you've lost a customer, your revenue retention here is actually 110%, uh, which means you've actually like gained, like the retention is, is positive or your churn is negative. Um, for a lot of businesses, particularly SaaS businesses, this is actually the expectation. Uh, investors actually wanna see negative churn rates or these, these over 100 retention rates. They wanna see customers growing on net, uh, even though some may be dropping off and, and churning out. Um, so which one do you use? Uh, show the important one. Like if you're a SaaS business, show things like revenue retention, that's important. If you're a company where the number of users don't really matter that much, don't so show user retention. If you're a product where you need a bunch of people to use it, show user retention. It's be mindful of what it is that you're actually trying to do uh, and show that one, not just show the best one or the one that, that paints you in the best light. Uh, all right, second thing is this DAU over MAU ratio. Uh, people have probably heard of this. 
Uh, this is something that Facebook popularized like back in 2010-ish um, as a metric for how sticky Facebook was. It's something that then became a little bit more of a, of a common thing that people looked at to compare you to Facebook to say, okay, great, if Facebook has this really high number, how do you do in, in this metric? Uh, and what it is is it's in a given month, how many average daily active users do you have divided by how many total active users use the product in that month? Um, it's a little bit like hard to kind of get your head around to show, to show you some examples. Uh, say you have 100 people using your product every month um, or every day and 1,000 people total use it in a month. Your DAU over MAU ratio is 10%. Sort of you can do the, the simple math down the rest of this. Uh, like I said, it's a little bit of a weird number. Like what does that 25% actually mean? It's, it's not something that has sort of an intuitive way to understand it. So I actually think it's much easier to think about this number by multiplying it by 30. Um, if you multiply your DAU over MAU ratio by 30, what you get is roughly the number of days that the average user uses your product in a given month. Um, so really what this is saying is in this top example, the average customer is using your, or user is using your product three days a month. In the bottom example of this 50%, the average customer is using your product uh, 15 days a month. And so one, this is one of the reasons Facebook used this. I think their DAU over MAU ratio is like 45-ish percent. I may have that wrong. Um, which meant it was like 13 days a month that their average user was using it, which was a lot. Um, the kind of benchmark for this in customer products is often around 25 to 30% which is again like 10 days a month. That's one of the things that people wanna see of a really sticky product. For enterprise products, it varies a lot since people are often only using them during work. Um, but if you have a DAU over MAU ratio for, for an enterprise product, uh, typically something like 25% is, is a pretty good number. Um, one important caveat with this is, it's an only an important metric if your product is something that's meant to be used every day. So if you're TurboTax, uh, it's probably not a very good metric because people aren't logging into TurboTax every day. Uh, so don't try to calculate this if, if that's what you're doing. If you're something that's designed for everyday usage, great, you can make use of it, but don't necessarily want to show it for, for products that aren't designed for this kind of everyday use. Uh, finally, uh, a measure here for stickiness that people use is the quick ratio. Uh, this is something that's become more popular recently. Uh, basically, it is a, it's a formula that's a little bit complicated, but it's a formula that's meant to compare monthly revenue growth with, growth with lost revenue. So what you can think about this is, say that this is like a hypothetical company. And each month they're adding this green bar of new revenue uh, and they're losing some revenue from existing customers in these red bars. And so the orange line is like what they net in new, new revenue every month. Um, this company and this company make the exact same amount of money every month. They're both bringing in the same amount of new revenue. But the company on the right is losing a lot. They're gaining a lot more, but they're losing a lot more. Um, the quick ratio is designed to differentiate between these two companies. If you look at revenue change or revenue growth, you'll see the exact same thing with these. What the quick ratio is designed to do is say, the company on the left looks very healthy, the company on the right looks like a leaky bucket. Uh, typically, investors much prefer the company on the left. Uh, if you have a, a situation like the one on the right, it's the sort of thing where, where people will always be concerned. So sort of no matter how fast you're growing, if you're losing a lot of revenue on the other end, uh, it's something that will always make folks worried. So this is a good number for you to sort of keep track of for yourself uh, because it's the kind of thing that, that you can get a sense of whether or not like you have a bunch of customers leaving, but it's also a good number that, that investors will often ask questions about to understand how much revenue is actually churning out each month, even if you still have a very high top line revenue growth. Um, the number that I think people look for in this typically is around four. Uh, these, the, the, there's a formula here that, that again sort of shakes out to a bunch of different things. Uh, but four is about the, the number here that's, that's often considered good. Um, so uh, the last bit of this, acquisition economics. Uh, how do you think about acquisition economics? Uh, so what are questions investors actually asking for for this? Uh, this is like, can you scale? So say you have good top line growth, say people are using your product. The question really is, can you now do that efficiently? Is it costing you a ton of money to bring in new customers? Are you spending a ton of money on ads and not actually acquiring much from it? Or do you have efficient growth channels that, that you can grow? So this is like, can you build a really big business on top, of, on top of the seed that you already have? Is it something that can potentially be profitable? Uh, those sorts of things are really what these questions are all about. Uh, so finally, we have, we have three more metrics. Uh, here we really get deep into the VC jargon world. Uh, so payback period, LTV over CAC, the magic number. Uh, so what are each of these things? So payback period is how long it takes for a customer to pay back the amount that it takes for you to acquire them. Uh, so to give you an example of that, it's like easy to say, it's a little hard to, to necessarily always get your head around. 
say that you spend $500 on Facebook ads. Um, so you send a bunch of ads, you get a bunch of impressions, great. Uh, a bunch of people click on it, some people sign up, a few of those people become customers. Say out of those $500 you spend on ads, you get five customers. Cost you 100 bucks to get each customer. So that's pretty straightforward. So out of the 500 bucks again, five customers, 100 bucks a customer. Uh, say that each customer pays you $10 a month. So you're some subscription service. Uh, of these 10 people, they all sign up, they get 10 bucks a month. Uh, that means that, that it takes them 10 months to pay you back. That assuming each of these customers sticks around forever, after 10 months, you'll actually be making money from their customers. Prior to those 10 months, you're actually just paying back the cost that it took you to acquire them. Uh, in practice, this actually is a little bit more complicated to calculate because you have to include things like your cost of sales, like if you have salespeople closing those deals, it's important to include those numbers. Uh, but in a simple example, you can kind of get a sense of, of what that looks like. Um, so yeah, so it's 100 bucks in 10 months, uh, so that's your payback period. This actually isn't great, um, or this is pretty good, rather. The 12 months is usually considered, considered a benchmark that's a good number for, for VC. Um, that, that it's usually healthy to be able to pay back your acquisition costs over 12 months. The reason for that, like you may ask like why, if I can pay back the acquisition costs at all, even if it takes three years, is that not still a positive thing for the business? The main reason for that is it means that you can take money that you're getting from your customers and invest it back quickly enough. Um, if it takes you three years to, to pay back your cost of acquiring a customer, then you're often gonna be in the red for a very long time. And as a startup, you don't actually have that long to be able to do it. Um, so it's, it's important to have like a healthy payback period, partly for that reason. It also shows that, that again, you can acquire these customers at a reasonable cost. Um, LTV over CAC is a similar number or, or similar concept, but it's instead of comparing how long it takes you to pay back the customer, it's comparing the cost of acquiring that customer with the long-term value that you actually get. So LTV stands for lifetime value. You wanna measure how much, what's the ratio between the lifetime value of a new customer and your, your cost of acquiring them. Um, so to go back to this example, again, say it's cost you 100 bucks uh, to get customers and they pay you $10 a month. Suppose the average customer spends two years buying your product and after two years they disappear. Uh, so that means that they pay you $240. Uh, so over the course of a, of a customer's lifetime, they're worth $240 to you. Again, it costs you 100 bucks to acquire them. So your LTV over CAC ratio is 2.4. Uh, that's actually not great. That's the number that, that would be a little bit disappointing here to investors. Typically the benchmark they look for in this is about three. Um, that the expectation is if you're above three, it's pretty good. If you're below three, it's, it's a sign of concern. Again, for the same reason, it means it's hard to scale. Uh, it also means that, that uh, if things start to change, say it becomes more expensive to acquire customers, uh, say that customers don't last for as long as you think they will, uh, then you're gonna start to run into some real unit economic problems. Uh, lifetime value. So it's the lifetime value of a customer. So that's why in, the other, in this slide, they pay you 10 bucks a month for two years, they'll pay you for 24 months or $240. Um, so finally, uh, a magic number. This is even sort of more of a in the weeds kind of formula. Um, it's basically comparing how much revenue that you bring in compared to your, your sales and marketing spend in the previous quarter. So it's a way to measure essentially what is the efficiency of that spend relative to your revenue growth that you got from it. Um, this is one that has sort of a, a meaningless number outside of the value of actually presenting a magic number to investors. Uh, but typically, if you're below 0.75 in this case, it's kind of a sign for concern. It's a sign that you probably aren't ready to start scaling sales and marketing. Uh, if you're above 1.5, it's very positive. If you're somewhere in the middle of that, it's you're a healthy company that might have some places to work on, uh, but generally things, are, things aren't terrible. Finally, there's kind of a, a meta tip for all of these things about customer acquisition costs. Uh, they're often only meaningful to, to folks who have bigger customer bases and not like huge customer bases, but it's not something that's super helpful for, for a very early stage company. If you only have a few customers or they've only been customers for, for a few months, it's very hard to actually calculate things like LTV. You don't know how, what the value of a customer is if all your customers are three months old. It's hard to calculate acquisition costs if you only have a handful of customers that you've acquired. Um, so it's not something you necessarily need to think about in, in fundraising. So it is important to keep in mind because you will get asked questions about it later. And these serve as the foundation for what investors will ask you about sort of the, the future of growing your business. They wanna make sure that you can still grow it in the future even if you're not in that stage today. And so having some sense of what these numbers are gonna be like or how you might actually forecast them is important for, for telling that story. Um, so, all right, we've got all these things. Uh, we've got these like nine metrics that are important for fundraising. Like what do we do with that? What do we do now? That's it's like. Sounds all great, we can do this, but how do we actually put these things together? Um, 
so there's there's kind of a secret about this is is these things actually can be calculated from from just a few pieces of data. Uh, it seems like it's a pretty complicated thing, but in reality, you can actually get all of these numbers from from a relatively simple source. Um, so if you have a table that looks like this, uh, that is just a table of every day that somebody used your product, the date they used it, and who that person was, you can actually calculate all four of these numbers. So just with these like this two column table, there's actually ways to get your number of signups, you can get daily active users, you can get retention rates, and you can calculate DAU over MAU. So if you have this, then great, you have like you're halfway there basically. Um, if you have a table that looks like this of a month, a customer, and how much they pay you, then you can actually get these other numbers. You can get monthly revenue, you can get reten revenue retention, uh, you can also get logo or customer retention, and you can get your quick ratio. All again, just from these three columns of data. This is another reason why it's important to keep track of like that monthly thing early, is because it, it's what enables you to, to be able to calculate these things. And finally, if you keep track of this, plus you add another table that is just your monthly sales and marketing spend, uh, then you can calculate the rest of these. So all of these things come directly from, from those three tables uh, and like seven columns of data and half of those tables are just the actual date. Uh, so it's actually not that bad. Like with, these, with this data, you can actually get it all together. There are ways to do it. Um, and so calculating these things can be pretty straightforward. Uh, there is a side of that though, it's like less straightforward, which is okay, how do I get those tables? Uh, and, and that's something that isn't as easy as it may seem. Uh, part of that is because the data from this comes from a bunch of different sources. So uh, you have like this user table, this revenue table, this marketing and sales spend table. In reality, that's not coming from one place. It's often coming from a bunch of different places. So your user table is probably coming from production data or it's coming from something like Google Analytics um, or Mixpanel or whatever it is you use to track that. Uh, your revenue comes from Salesforce if you're using that to log where, you, where your contracts are. Maybe you're using Stripe or Recurly or things like that to, to actually keep track of payments. Um, Marketing spend comes from all sorts of places. If you're spending stuff on Facebook or Google or Twitter or wherever else, um, it's also from things if you're using products like Drift or, or Marketo or Intercom. Uh, so how do you actually get all this together? And this process actually can be pretty painful. Um, the way that we did this back in the early days was we'd go to these tools, we'd export a bunch of stuff, we'd manually put it all on spreadsheets, we'd manually put that all in decks. It was a great time. Uh, <laughs> this is the sort of shameless plug part of this presentation. Uh, so this is what this looked like. It was hell. We had like somebody do it for two months and we had a deck and it was all beautiful, but this one person wanted to quit. Um, there's a better way of doing that. So there's tools like Segment and Fivetram. Uh, these are AWS partners. Uh, they will actually get data out of these services for you. Uh, and they will put it in Amazon Redshift, which is an AWS product. Um, so you can do something like this. So you can set up Segment or Fivetran. It's really easy to do. You can just like fill out a bunch of forms, there's no coding involved. Uh, it'll suck data out of all these different sources and pipe it into a database. Uh, and so then you don't have to manually pull in this data, you have it all in nice structured ways that you can then, then analyze it there. Uh, on top of that, you can use Mode, uh, so that's what, what I do. Um, so Mode sits on top of your database and it builds live reports rather than decks on top of that data in, in the database. Uh, so from here you can now, instead of having all of these spreadsheets that you have to do, you can just like have a live report and mode that will calculate all of this for you. Uh, this is actually what we do. So this is a screenshot of our actual internal mode at mode. Uh, when we want to put together these numbers, we want to be able to look at these sorts of dashboards rather than doing all of this through spreadsheets. There's this button you click, it usually finishes in a few seconds, and then we have all of those nine metrics that we want to see. Um, so what do you do now? Like say you're starting, okay, how do I actually go about thinking about metrics for fundraising? Uh, get your data in order. That's, that's the foundational piece of this, that all of this has to be built on top of that and this process isn't so bad. In particular, uh, this whole thing can be done in like a day, um, that all of this, none of this requires any code, all of it requires just you filling out forms. Uh, we actually have like a demo that we do for folks that we can do this from, from zero, from like zero website, no product, to having data in mode reporting on it in like an hour. Uh, and so it's something that's, that's very straightforward to do. To make it a little easier, also, uh, we have actually built some of these like fundraising templates. So these are things that are reports that are built on top of the data that comes out of Stripe or Salesforce or whatever else um, that you can just plug and play on top of your data to get things started. Uh, you can go here, they're available there. I'll show this link later, it'll get shared, so you can check it out. Anyway, um, so yeah, so straightforward, do it, get your data set up. It's, it's way easier than, than it often initially seems uh, and it's a, it's a very helpful thing to do. 
Um, so why is it helpful? I have kind of a few closing tips on, on fundraising in general, but also in terms of how data actually plays into that beyond just providing these very basic metrics. Um, so for my final three slide or three bullet slide, uh, there's a few things I want to talk about that are these kind of tips about fundraising generally uh, and thinking about not just the, the numbers behind it, but what is it actually goes into a successful pitch. Uh, so one of those things is have a narrative. That despite all of this, despite data being so important, like that's a critical part of your story, it's not enough. That you have to have a, a story around what it is that you're actually pitching. You have to have a story around why your company should exist. You have to have a story around like how you play in the market that you play in. Uh, and so this is a, a, a blog post I think from, from First Round Capital about like this is how you make a, a really compelling pitch. It's not just the data, it's the storytelling. And so think about what that story is. Um, it's also what brings all of this together, that, that these other aspects are important, especially early stage. Investors care a lot about your team. They care a lot about your market. They care a lot about your vision. And so you have to tie that in. And the more you can tie that into to the data behind your product, uh, the better you can be. And the narrative is the way that you do that. Um, so a few tips about that. Uh, one, lead with your best story. So it's really tempting when you're putting this together to have this deck that's like this big build to this big crescendo or you have some big reveal and like tell this story and it's all amazing. Uh, it won't happen in a, like a pitch five minutes in, people will start asking questions, the whole thing will get derailed, you'll never actually get to tell that story, your like big reveal will get ruined. If you have a thing you wanna say, put it at the very beginning and frame the entire conversation around this like great piece of data that you have. Don't try to bury that at the end behind some like amazing reveal. Just say it up front, make sure that's the thing that you're talking about, and frame the entire conversation around that part of the story. Uh, second is understand your customer. Your customer here is a VC. Uh, understand what it is they like. So different investors will be looking into different things. Some people have different theses about what it is they want to invest in. Uh, tie your story to that. Some investors are very focused on amazing products, and they want products that are just delighting customers left and right. Some VCs invest in markets and invest in opportunities in those markets. Understand what that customer is. Present the same data in most cases, but present the data around the story that the investor wants to see. Uh, and finally, get outside feedback. This is another place where, where we should have done more of this up front, that when you're in this, you feel like you know exactly the story you want to tell. You feel like you know why you're, you're building this company that you're building. Get feedback from other people that aren't as exposed to it. The people you're going to be pitching are going to be seeing this for like 15 minutes. Uh, they're not going to have the same background you are. They're not going to be as buried in the problem as you are. They're not necessarily going to have the same reaction to your story the way, that, the way that you do. And the more that you can get outside feedback about like, how does this story resonate, does it land, uh, the better off than it'll be to, to folks who are seeing it for the first time. Um, another thing is better data can also create a better story. So at Mode, in a couple of our fundraising rounds, we had all these other metrics put together. We had sort of the, the sort of benchmark metrics that we needed to show. Uh, and then we wanted to think about how do we actually tell the story in a richer way. And in both cases, we actually did that using data. Um, so this slide was actually, this is actually a slide from our uh, Series A deck, I believe, that was showing this is how much time people are spending on mode. And like, look, it's increasing. Modes become stickier and stickier. This isn't one of those kind of core metrics that people wanted to see, but it was something that really fit into the narrative that we were trying to tell around mode being a place that analysts and data scientists lived. Uh, and so we could tie that back to this to this quantitative story that really, really drove home the, the round for our Series A. Um, and this was, this was a slide, again, this was an actual slide that was in our Series B deck. Uh, and this was something, again, that tied in this story of like, data isn't just about a few companies, it's not just about tech companies or, or, or the companies you might think of that are really using data. Data is across all different industries. And so we wanted to tell that story, and we told that story by showing the expansion of mode across a bunch of different verticals. Um, and so again, not necessarily something people wanted to see, it wasn't in sort of the, the things that they're expecting, uh, but by being able to, to tell a nice tight, tight story and being able to tell that with data, it was something that really made a big difference in those pitches. Uh, so the next thing here is creating urgency. Um, so one of the things that drives investors more than anything is like FOMO. Uh, they don't wanna miss the next big thing. They don't wanna have to write some answer on Quora about like they lost, they were the person who passed on Uber or whatever. Uh, one of the reasons that you can, ways you can create that is creating a sense of urgency that they have to make a decision. If they don't feel like they have to make a decision, they'll continue to just like wait and bleed you out and give you the whole like, eh, things look pretty good, talk to us in a month, get back to us. It's like super frustrating. 
Uh, so try to do this on your own schedule. Try to create urgency by, by like getting investors to, to work on your schedule rather than just like operating on their schedule where they can constantly wait for, we want to see a little bit more. We want to see a little bit more traction, maybe a little bit more progress, maybe a couple more months of data. Um, so there's a couple things you can do here to, to create urgency. One is set dates. Uh, be like, hey, we're going to try to close this round on this date. We have, we have partner pitches on this date. Set dates that you want to get stuff done. Investors will stick to that. Um, if they know there's timelines they have to hit, they will do the things they have to do to hit them. Uh, but if you don't give them timelines, they are absolutely not going to try to stick to them. So sort of own the calendar. Second thing in this is, uh, and this is a little bit more controversial, don't take every meeting. If every time you get an email from an investor, you're like, great, I'll send you more information, I'll talk more. It's clear that you aren't the one owning that schedule. It's clear that they're the ones who are asking all the questions, that they're the ones who are managing that relationship. Uh, you don't want to like big league people like the Mark Zuckerberg social network movie where you show up in your pajamas or whatever, but you don't have to take every meeting. The meetings that they have are for them. They are not for you. Uh, and so again, own the schedule, own the calendar, and create the urgency that you need to create to be able to get the round done. Better data though also can be an important part of this. So one of the things that will happen when you're raising money is people will ask you for data. They'll ask you for oh, I need to see more information about your signups, or I need to see more information about your financials, or whatever. If you can send them like really tight data, they will know that other investors could be ready to invest. If you don't have that information ready, then they'll know like, okay, you're clearly not ready to close this round. If they ask for a question of like, we need this and this and this information, and you have to like go get it for a week, then other investors are asking the same question, and they know there's no urgency for them to have to make a decision. If you say, great, here is everything, it's all tightly packaged up, then it's obvious to them that you are ready to close this round. Other investors could be ready to pull this trigger, and so they have to do the same thing. So this is an actual, e actual email that we got um, in one of our, I think this is our Series B, um, where we put together this like very tightly packaged data room, I think is like the finance word for it, uh, of all of the data that we had, and we got this email back from, from a very well-known VC that was like, great, this is exactly what we need. We love the format. We'll be in touch soon. We were able to create a lot of urgency around this fundraise because this person knew, okay, we were ready to close this round and we weren't waiting on them to, to be able to ask a bunch of questions to do that. Um, so finally, uh, markets matter. Uh, it's easy, again, when you're buried in this to think like, I've got an amazing product. My customers are going to love it. I, like, that's all we need. We have a great team. We're ready to go do this. Uh, no matter how good your product is, investors will dig it on your market. They will hammer you on your market. Be ready for questions about your market. Uh, so how do you do that? One, know who your customer is. In this case, is like the actual customer, not the VC is the customer. Um, and by that I mean, say you're like a food delivery service. Your customer isn't people who eat. Uh, you need to know like your customers, who is it that's buying food from you in this product in this way? Why is like your food delivery service that serves sushi at 2 a.m., like why is that a meaningful, a meaningful market? Who is the market that you're actually selling to there? Um, and, and know who that is very precisely and understand how big it is and know how you sell to them. You will get questions asked about this, uh, and so, so be ready for those. Another thing, and this is a thing that investors love to ask, is how do you get to $100 million in revenue on top of this market? Um, there's like, this is probably just one of those things that everybody does, so everybody does it, like it became just part of the, the fundraising tradition. Uh, the real reason for it like, probably is that based on software or tech company multiples, 100 million in revenue, which is a nice round number, is like a billion dollar valuation, which is an even bigger round number. Um, so that's kind of where that comes from. But what it really means is I want to see that you have a path to being able to be a really big company. Uh, and again, that's why understanding your customer is so important. It's like, what does the world look like for you to get to $100 million? And it can't just be, again, we're a food delivery service and people buy $100 million worth of food. It's how does the world change for you to get there? Who are the people that are doing it? What, who of your competition is getting less money? Uh, is your market growing enough to support this? Can you actually acquire that many customers? Do you need to have like a billion orders of food every day or every month to be able to do that? That's probably not realistic. Like are there realistic paths for you to be able to get there? Um, people don't expect you to get this exactly right, obviously, especially if you're early stage, but it's important to show that you've thought about it. It's important to show that you've like anticipated where things might go. Um, better data here also means fewer questions. And in a lot of cases, the market questions, the more questions you get asked, sort of the less good of a job you've done, sort of polishing those things off in the pitch. You want to get over these questions. These aren't questions that are usually good for you. They're usually looking for reasons not to invest when they're talking about the market and if it's big enough. 
Um, so if you were able to anticipate a lot of those questions and provide that data up front, then you won't get questions about these. You'll get questions about the things you want to talk about, like how great your product is or how great your team is and all that kind of stuff. Um, so finally, you want more, like if you're sick of hearing this about from me uh, and you want more information or people who've done a lot more of this than I have, uh, a few good resources. So one, there's a, a VC at Redpoint. Uh, his name is Tom Tungas. Um, he's written a lot about this. He writes a lot about like finances, particularly for public companies. Uh, so they're later stage, but they're the sorts of things that give you a really good perspective of how investors think. Um, his perspective on this and how he evaluates these, these public company financials is the way sort of at a, at a bigger scale that most investors evaluate very small company financials. Uh, similarly, I'd recommend Jason Limpkin's Quora. He's pretty popular there and in other places. Uh, he answers a bunch of questions about these same sorts of topics, uh, the sort of metrics that you need to, to have for fundraising, various things in, in the fundraising process. Um, he also is a good person that, that you get a perspective of this is how investors think. Uh, finally, there's this thing called the Magic 8-Ball that Social Capital put together. Uh, it is not something that, uh, the Social Capital is actually not a thing anymore. Um, but they put together this, this service where you could fill in a bunch of data and it would spit out the way that they would evaluate it. It was like a really good peek into the way that they would sort of quantitatively evaluate the health of a company based on, on the numbers that you have. Um, also, if you just Google that, there's a bunch of articles around it. Uh, Social Capital's data scientist uh, wrote a bunch of articles about it that are pretty good. Uh, so finally, the kind of last point here is in all of this process, if you're going out fundraising, uh, you'll get this a lot. Um, you'll get rejected from a bunch of people and even more people will just like ghost you and you'll never hear from them again. Uh, <laughs> It's frustrating, it sucks, it's annoying, like it's the sort of thing where, where you do fall into these pits of despair of this will never work. Um, that's okay, that's part of the process. Uh, everybody goes through that, unless you are again the slacks or the birds of the world, uh, you will get lots of rejections. Like I don't even wanna know how many times we got rejected for things in the process of raising this money. The important thing is that you only need one. Uh, you only need one person per round to, to get bought in. Uh, and if you have the product and you have like the data and you have the story that's tight around it, you will find that person. Uh, there's a lot of investors out there. There's a lot of people who are excited about different products. Uh, if you have the right story, then you'll find it. And if you have the right data, you'll be able to find it. But you just have to have to push through what is will feel like an endless list of rejections before you get there. Uh, so with that, uh, questions. Uh, yeah, so the question was, usually investors invest in companies where founder 50 percent of the founders have prior experience. What do I think about that? Um, so one of the things that investors, especially in early stage, when, when you're to the point where you don't have traction or you don't have like numbers, once you have numbers, none of the rest of it really matters. It's just like, are you proving out that you can do this? When you're in the early stage, uh, people want to believe that you can do it and other people can't. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have prior experience, but if you go and say like, I'm going to build a, a machine that builds people's Ikea furniture, you need to be able to prove like why you can do that. Maybe you worked at Ikea and you understand how these things get built really well. Like maybe you're some robotics person, you know how to do that. But if it's just like me and I show up and I'm building a machine to build Ikea furniture, they're gonna have some questions as to why I can do it. Maybe I have like a great prototype and I've proven that I can. So there's not, you don't have to have some requirement, but if you don't have anything to show, they're gonna have to base the entire, like whether or not they wanna invest on do I believe that this person can do it and prior experience and something related is important there. So there aren't these sort of hard and fast rules, but like it would be hard for me to raise money trying to build a machine to, to build IKEA furniture. Uh, all right. I believe in you. All right, appreciate that. Um, so uh, first question here, uh, how is LTV estimated? Ooh, uh, so that's fun. Um, so it's kind of complicated. It depends on exactly like what your customers are like. Basically, the, the easiest way to do it is you, if once you, you have to have some data. If you've got like three months of data, then you're sort of hosed in estimating it. It's a little bit of like finger in the wind and sort of say, we think it'll be this. Um, benchmarking against like standard churn rates and stuff like that. But if like you have three months of customers and nobody's ever churned, who knows what your LTV is. Um, the easiest way to typically do it is once you have a year or two of data, basically to estimate what your churn rate is each month and then figure out okay, what is the average time a person will be a customer? So say you lose 10% of your customers every month, then like on average a customer will be around for 10 months is basically the way that math works out. What is the average customer paying you every month? 
say it's 100 bucks, your LTV is about 1,000. Like you get a, an average of 100 bucks, bucks a month for an average of 10 months based on these sort of average churn rates and, and uh, average sizes of contracts. That's not always gonna be perfect. There are ways to make that much more complicated. Um, you can go very much in the weeds in that. You can probably take like whole business school classes on how to do this. Uh, but in general, that's the way that you would do it early on. And, and for investors, that's usually good enough. Um, they understand that you don't need to put together some sort of super like tight model. It's more about understanding broadly what they think the economics of this thing will look like. Um, how do you pick VCs to pitch to? Uh, oh, that one went away. Oh, there it is. Um, so partly this is a matter of uh, who is available to you. It's also a matter of who you want. Um, I would say there's like one way you can do it is just go find the top tier people. You can figure out who those are off of various lists on the internet. Um, if you want to just pitch to top tier people, great. Get connections and pitch to them. Um, the other way to think about it is who is it that provides strategic value to you? Uh, are they investors that are, are connected to your space? Do they provide connections to other customers? Um, are they people who, who you think would like be partners in you building this business? Or are they someone who's just going to write a check and disappear? Uh, a lot of it, though, is a more personal relationship. A lot of it is like who, when you pitch, do you like working with? You have to think about these people as like you're hiring a semi-boss for a very long time. Uh, you want to find somebody who you can work with. Like they will be in it with you through hard times and through good times and through lots of stuff. Uh, you want to make sure you're finding someone that, that you can actually have that partnership with. Uh, and so in a lot of cases, the actual choice of, of, say you have options of who to take money from, I would take money from the person, like there's like obviously things about like terms of deal and all that, but all else equal, take money from the person you want to work with because like you'll have to work with them a lot. Um, how does this advice change for B2B or enterprise companies? It doesn't really. Th these numbers are actually probably most closely aligned with, with B2B or enterprise companies. Um, the, the, the places typically where you would focus less because of those are on things like user numbers. Uh, so say you're, you're a product uh, that you're a, I don't know, say you're, you're an AWS service um, and you're a startup that's building something like that. You probably don't care that much about your daily active users because you may be a platform that people log into once a month to like tweak some stuff. Uh, what you care about though is like how many people are buying your product, what's your customer numbers, what's your revenue numbers and all the numbers that come out of that. So in a lot of cases, these numbers are very much the same, just less tilted towards like daily active users or, or the actual user stickiness if that's not what your product does. Um, your site says free forever. Is that for all users or sizes of accounts? No, it is not. Uh, <laughs> we will charge you one day. Um, not free for, it's free forever if you use a particular kind of it. Uh, it so Mode is a freemium product. Um, we have a simpler service that we provide for free. Uh, there's a lot of features that are behind paywalls. Uh, if you want those features, you have to pay us. That's how the world works. Um, what is the best way to handle data analytics question which you could determine but don't have on hand to pitch? That is, how to save face if you're not prepared by a question that you could easily find out. Oh, this is a good question. So say you're in a pitch and someone's like, okay, I have this. If I have a question like, what is a daily active user? You kind of can't save face. You need to know what that is. Um, if it's something that's a lot harder, if it's something of like, well, how many customers do you have in this vertical that have like signed on in this month or whatever, it's fine to punt on it. It's fine to say you'll follow up. Um, they don't expect you to know everything. And, and in a lot of cases, if you can like pull all these numbers, just you have them in your head, that's not actually a great sign. Like you don't need to be memorizing everything. Um, it's fine to be able to go back and say like, cool, I'll get you that. Estimate what you can estimate. Say like, oh, I think for, for a broader set of customers, it's something like this, or, or you know, we're focused on this other thing or whatever. But you don't need to actually have the answers there. People aren't, there will be times when, when investors are sort of trying to get you with these gotcha type of stuff. Um, typically, those sorts of things aren't it. And you're fine to say, okay, I'll follow up later, and then just send an email once you do it. And that's actually a place that you can, you can impress people, whereas if they ask these questions, if you send something that's like a very thorough, here's the thing, and here's like, two questions beyond that or some data that's richer than that, uh, that often can be like a very impressive thing to investors of, of how much you have it together that you didn't memorize this number, but you can like go get all of the information they might possibly need uh, on top of that. Um, what are some other startups you've seen with crazy numbers aside from Bird and Lime? I, I, I don't know. Uh, look on Hacker News about what people are upset about <laughs> and you'll find some stuff. Uh, <laughs> Should R&D be considered a cost with calculating LTV, et cetera? No. So uh, LTV is irrespective of cost. 
Um, LTV is just about how much a customer pays you. So you could cost, like, the LTV of, of building the Salesforce tower is the cost of, a, or how much a tenant pays them. It makes no difference if the Salesforce tower costs a trillion dollars to build. Um, for thinking about CAC, R&D does not go into it, but other aspects of your business do. So, and this is a place where it gets sort of, you can again have sort of whole business school classes on this, that the easiest way to think about it is just like, what is the cost of actually acquiring that customer through ads? Typically people wanna see cost of sales on top of that as well, which is like your sales team uh, cost, how much do you pay them in salary, what do you pay them in quota, things like that. Um, it is not though like your R&D cost. That is often in a, in a very different bucket. There's either like an intermediate thing too, which is the cost of goods served, um, which is like your, your AWS bill, if you're on AWS, which I assume all of you are. Um, that is something that is not a part, of, uh, a part of CAC. That can go into LTV if you get into the very complicated part, like you can discount LTV from that because you're not actually making that money if you're using it to serve the good. Uh, but in a lot of cases, especially for early stage companies, none of this really matters. It's kind of all hand wavy. As long as you have sort of the, the foundations of it right, that's really what people are after. Do you ever get feedback from VCs? Uh, yes, and you can ask for it. Um, sometimes it'll, it's less sort of like asking for feedback in a job interview. Sometimes people will give you something and it's great and it's, it's insightful. Sometimes they'll give you something that's like, wasn't well, a culture fit and you have no idea what to do with it. Um, take it all with a grain of salt. Like VCs don't invest for lots of reasons. They may not tell you every reason why. Uh, it may be that like the partner who was up for the board seat wasn't into it, but the rest of the board, the partnership was, but they weren't able to sort of get behind it. Uh, those sort of internal political things often won't come up in feedback and you can't really do anything about it. Uh, but pay attention to it if they give you feedback about the pitch, about you know, what it is. It's easy to kind of dismiss it as like, you don't know, you don't have the perspective I do. I understand this market better than you do. Like once you're in the weeds with this, it is frustrating to talk to someone for 20 minutes, have them tell you you're wrong on the thing you've been working on for three years. Um, but take that feedback seriously. Like they do have a different perspective and if nothing else, they have a perspective that other VCs are likely to have. So you can get feedback. Um, I would, I would uh, again, kind of take it with a little bit of a grain of salt, but take it seriously. Um, what are the best metrics for early seed pitches? Uh, in a lot of cases, this depends on where you are. So say you are like pre-revenue, which I assume is what this is. Um, if you have product traction, it's all of these things with product traction. It's just like, are people signing up for your product? Are people sticking around? People want to see some proof point that they can build a business on top of it. Um, if you have no product and say you're like, we have a vision for building my Ikea furniture thing. Um, in that case, you don't really have metrics you can show. That's where you have to be able to tell the story behind, here's how this market's gonna work out, here's why like Ikea sells a ton of furniture and all these people need help building it. Uh, here's why I, as a robotics person, am the right person to build it. There aren't as much metrics there as much as strictly narrative about why I am the company or we are the team uh, that can build this, why this market needs this product. Um, and, and why there, you have like a vision for that to turn into something potentially very big. Is it worth it to go over projections or just hard data? What if we've only started generating revenue less than a year? <sighs> projections aren't much good at that point. Um, it's, it's fine to show them, and it's useful to show them again on things like this, how do I get to $100 million in revenue, to show that there is a viable path for you to do that that doesn't require you to like, again, have some ridiculous number to get there. It doesn't have to require you to, like, you to have 100% retention forever for you to get there. Um, but you have, to, you have to understand that like, you can't share those projections and be like, look, this is what's actually gonna happen. Everybody's gonna look at that slide of, of here's our forecast of like, look at this growing curve uh, and know that you've sort of made that up. Um, again, the important thing is to show that you've thought it through, not necessarily like you've done this in a, in a particularly like brilliant way. Like when we, we did some projections, I think when we raised our series A, they were basically us looking at a, like a funnel of we expect this many people to come to the site. We think the conversion rate will be like this and it'll sort of decay because it probably will. Um, and like that's, that's all we did. And again, it was sort of, here's a story for how we think we can get there, but we weren't doing something that was super scientific. How many Series A investors ask for some cover, some of the analytics you cover? Um, most of them, all of them. Uh, the only people I think who would not ask for it is if you are raising money to build a product that costs a lot of money to build that you don't actually have uh, customers for yet. So say you're building a self-driving car company and you've got to like raise $100 million to get anything off the ground, they may not ask for, for metrics there just because you have nothing to show. But if you have a product, if you have revenue, you will get asked. Yes? So 
Mostly take it at face value. Depends on how incredulous. Uh, if you say you make $100 million, they will be like, you probably don't. Um, if, if you have some outrageous number, people will, they won't like, so show me your source. They'll kind of dig into it and be like, how did you get there? Um, but VCs don't, <laughs> take this not in a way of make it up, VCs don't do a ton of diligence on whether or not your numbers are right. A lot of this is taken on faith and like, you should do your numbers right. Th but there's not a lot of digging of like, prove it. The expectation here is that if you're saying it, you're getting it right. And, and sometimes you'll, you'll have something that like, you did it wrong, like, oh, we calculated that wrong. Oops, if you find that happen, like tell them. But, but yeah, people aren't gonna like audit it typically, so. Uh, so first, the question for the microphone thing before was, will they trust incredulous numbers? This question is, why would they trust you? For the same reason that you don't sign an NDA. So when, when, you, when you pitch investors, you will not sign an NDA. Investors will not sign NDAs. Um, that's what the relationship is. The relationship is their entire brand is that they need to be able to come in and trust people and you need to be able to trust them. And like, that's what it's about. Like, yeah, there could be people who abuse that, but it will be very quickly figured out which investors are the ones that are abusing their position of seeing all these pitches that aren't under NDA. Nobody will talk to them. If you're the company that invented a number, you'll get sued, potentially. Or it's like, if it wasn't a big enough check, they'll just write you off and disappear. Like, it, it's, it's bad for everybody to invent that stuff, and basically the ecosystem is built up around there's enough trust that people aren't trying to, trying to like, cheat it. The, yeah, they'll, and they'll dig into things like that. Like, it, so the question was, will they check references, or do they check references and things like that? Yeah, they'll check references. Like, they will, they will certainly try to understand who you are and don't trust everything on, on face value. But for the most part, it's, it's not a system that's, that's one where everybody's like auditing everything. Also, it's, it's impractical for them to do that. Like, if you say, here's our, our, our retention numbers, it's impractical for them to send someone on site to be like, show me your queries. Like, that's just not gonna happen. Um, all right, last few questions. Uh, what are the best analytics if you're establishing a new market? Um, if you have traction, again, the same things. Like, so, so prove that, that this can happen. A lot of these customer acquisition numbers are important for new markets because say you're selling to somebody who doesn't exist yet or you're trying to prove that this is a new thing. Showing that there's actually people that you can sell to at a reasonable cost is important. Uh, if you don't actually have revenue yet, a lot of it is doing like, deeper research on the market itself. Um, people will be skeptical of like, we're a product that doesn't exist for a new market. Like that's a pretty big ask. There's a lot of products out there. There's a lot of markets, like things are pretty saturated in most places. If you believe you're genuinely starting a new market, uh, it's good to have a lot of research on why you think that market is actually distinct. Um, what other kind of analytics does Mode support? Uh, so Mode is, a, Mode is a sort of general purpose analytics software. Um, it is something that sits on top of your databases, things like Redshift or competitors that I will not name, um, you can do whatever you want with it. So you can write queries against it. You can take those queries and pass them to things like Python and R notebooks. You can visualize them. Uh, you can build reports and dashboards and, and all sorts of things. So it is not designed strictly for fundraising. It is designed for data teams that want to learn things from their data. If you want to build reports on marketing performance, or you want to build reports on sales performance, or on product usage, or on <coughs> other things that aren't related to any of that at all, you can very much do that. Uh, so yeah. How many seed stage investors ask for some analytics that you cover? Um, people, seed stage investors are, are very much kind of a, it's, it, they vary seed stage to seed stage, um, especially angels, like angels are, are individuals that have their own sort of perceptions on these things. Uh, they will ask for similar-ish stuff sometimes. They tend to be, again, because it's earlier, more narrative driven, more believers in your background, your product, uh, like why you think there's a, there's a vision there. Um, but they'll often want to see the same stuff. 
the, the less sophisticated, it's often simpler numbers. So it's often like, show me signups, show me whether or not people are using your product, show me retention. Um, the more sophisticated the investor, typically the more sophisticated the numbers they ask for. Uh, and finally, what are some important metrics to consider expenses or burn? There aren't a lot, honestly. So it's essentially like, how much are you spending? Um, investors will have sort of a, a gut on this stuff where if you have a burn of a certain number, they'll be like, ooh, seems high, I don't want to touch it. Uh, that's not really based on a lot. Um, there are some numbers that, that you can just Google that'll like these sort of things like these magic, uh, magic numbers or quick ratios that are sort of tied to, to burn. But for the most part, burn is like a, an investor specific sensitivity. Some investors want to see companies that are very capital efficient. They want to see companies that are like only burning a little bit and sort of being thrifty with their spending. Some investors are much more aggressive and like don't care at all what burn is as long as the other numbers look good. Uh, so in those cases, it's, it's again, understanding your customer about like what it is they care about there. Um, in general, like it's probably good to think about burn as running a business, uh, but investors often won't, won't ask that much about it um, unless there's like reasons for them to be concerned. Yes. So as part of the deck uh, or the presentation, did investors generally expect that you will uh, be able to present how you can utilize the funding and how that will scale the business? That's a good question. Uh, so the question is, do people present, uh, do they expect a presentation on how you're going to spend the money that they give you? They do, um, in, in broad strokes. So it's typically like we are going to invest in, say you're raising $10 million, we're going to invest in hiring product development folks and we're gonna focus on, on the product. Or we are gonna invest a lot in expanding internationally. Are we going to invest in uh, growing our sales team because we think that the, the economics of like an outbound sales motion are the right thing for us. That's the kind of level they often look for. It's not like we're gonna spend, it's, it's good to have kind of the financials of, we expect our headcount to look like this and like this is how it's all gonna bake out. That doesn't really come up as much. It's more that planning exercise they care about seeing. But really what they're asking is, okay, say you're raising $10 million. Are you raising it to, to like blow up your sales and marketing team to try to go get a bunch of customers? Are you raising it to really spend it all on the product development? Like where are you putting the money in the business is, is often the place that they really ask about. Yes. Mm -hmm. that kind of makes sense. So does the product that runs itself, how the user is more concerned? So, yeah, so one is, if, if it is a product that companies buy, all of the, the revenue and customer numbers still apply. So like, say you're selling this AI product to customers, how many people are buying it, do they continue using it? The assumption is if they are buying it and they're paying for it, then something is working. Um, if you have other things that can tell that story, so say that this is like a, you're an AI platform that people are making some like API call to be able to get some prediction out of it. Um, are customers increasing the number of what they're doing there? Like, do you wanna show depth of engagement with the product? And so like, depending on what the product is, that may be something different, but the volume of requests coming in or like things like that, the, the breadth of the product they're using, they used to use it for one service, now they use it for 10. That kind of stuff can show, hey, the product is something that's really sticky, even if it's not a user, there's one that's using it. Yeah, there's lots of ways to, to do that. Uh, cool, yeah, we have one last question. How to count active users? It, it depends on your product. So, so in the case of, say you're the New York Times, is the active users, the number of people who like visit your website every day, is the active users the number of subscribers who visit your website every day? Is the active users the number of people who like read three articles? It, it's up to you. Like that is a thing that you should just define. You should have a consistent way of defining it. But that is like what it is that you think is the, the definition of someone who's using your product. Um, again, it doesn't matter that much what that is, as long as it's something that makes sense and like an active user is someone who can provide value to the product. But it's, it's, it's up to you to define it. Just be consistent about it. Uh, well, cool. Uh, I think we're probably well over time here. So thanks, y'all.